The Wealth of Some Nations Section Imperialism and the Reserve Army of Labor In Marxist terms, the Reserve Army of Labor is the unemployed and underemployed population of capitalist societies. For Marx, the oversupply of labor in relation to its demand depresses the value of wages, which he defines as the value of labor power. In the early period of capitalist industrialization in Britain, the reserve army of labor was principally augmented by 1. Technological unemployment caused by the concentration and development of industry. 2. Outmigration from the rural areas following the relative contraction of petty agricultural production. And 3. The ruination of relatively backward, largely artisanal, production in the towns. In terms of the present analysis, the capitalist centers witnessed a historical decline in the importance of factors 2 and 3, but crucially, the colonial and semi-colonial countries did not. Rather, the process of separating the producers from their means of production, so-called primitive accumulation, and the dispossession of the peasantry, is a more or less permanent feature of underdevelopment alongside the subordination of national to imperialist industry. Accumulation by dispossession is primarily affected through state and corporate land grabs, typically resulting in proletarianization or semi-proletarianization of rural populations. These plantation, mining, energy, and infrastructural initiatives are predominantly carried out in the global south, where extractivism is invariably connected to multinational and allied, quote, national, capital's ability to appropriate underdeveloped countries' resources for sale in affluent markets. Imperialism of this kind results in competition among displaced workers for limited jobs in export processing zones and commercial centers, producing constant downward pressure on wage levels. The resultant low wages are reproduced in the low prices of global south exports. Meanwhile, Whereas accumulation by dispossession increased the size of the reserve army of labor, capital scarcity occasioned by the commercial hegemony of business monopolies based in and largely catering to the markets of the global north ensures that the demand for labor in the global south lags behind its supply. The decapitalization of the exploited countries through the persistent loss of value affected by colonialism financial imperialism, and unequal exchange sets limits to industrial accumulation therein. These limits are further restricted by the meager basis for domestic sales allowed by the low wages of the working masses. In the imperialist countries, however, the low prices of third world goods tend to compensate for the globalization of the reserve army of labor's overall deflationary effect upon wages. From the 1950s onward, but especially during the neoliberal period inaugurated in the 1980s, the spread of multinational corporations throughout the Third World in search of low-cost labor power constituted the internationalization of capitalist production. It was the vast, quote, external reserve army of labor in the underdeveloped countries that created a continuous movement of surplus population into the labor force and weakened labor globally. The depeasantization of vast swaths of the global south by large agribusiness interests, as well as the integration of the actually existing socialist countries into the world capitalist economy. Since the 1980s, hundreds of millions of Chinese workers have been displaced from the country's rural areas as a result of agricultural industrialization has resulted in the world's workforce increasing from 1.9 billion in 1980 to 3.1 billion in 2007. Today, fully 73% of global labor is located in the developing world, with 40% in China and India alone. Currently, the Global Reserve Army of Labor, GRAL, not including part-time workers, but including unemployed workers aged between 25 and 54, quote, vulnerably employed workers in the informal sector, 
and economically inactive workers consist of approximately 2.4 billion people, compared with 1.4 billion in the active labor force. Unquestionably, these figures point to a huge surfeit of labor supply within the global economy, holding back development in the agrarian south, insofar as massive unemployment in the countryside reduces the bargaining power of the rural workforce to such an extent that landlords can employ hired agricultural wage laborers for cultivation at a very low cost. As Chandra wrote more than 40 years ago, beginning of long quote, we may then infer that labor surplus on a scale that is probably unparalleled in human history is perpetuating the semi-feudal setup. Limited progress along the road to modernization cannot be ruled out. Without vigorous measures to reduce considerably that surplus, we fail to see how one can get out of the vicious circle or how capitalism can strike deep roots. End of long quote. In sum, the effects of the GRAL upon the class structure of imperialism are twofold. First, the GRAL induces relative wage stagnation worldwide, given an oversupply of labor relative to demand. Second, the monopolization of world production, distribution, and trade, and the attendant negation of price competition by firms based in the developed countries, ensures that the underdeveloped countries' exports are sold at prices reflecting the cheapness of their labor. As a consequence, the working class of the developed countries suffers stagnating wages, while paradoxically, it is able to enjoy increased purchasing power. The working class of the developing countries, meanwhile, suffers both low wages and correspondingly high prices. Paradoxically, its misery is only eased by employment in the low-wage economy. In the absence of a social safety net, see below, exploited wage labor is often less onerous than no wage labor at all. Global processes of labor stratification are similar to those which created an African proletariat in European and settler-occupied South Africa, including in the attendant ideological, political, and military superstructure. The difference is that neoliberal colonization, typically occurs under the banner of national independence, and is advanced by financial as well as agrarian capitalist interests. In both cases, gains for the proletarian and poor peasant majority in the underdeveloped areas are by and large resented by all metropolitan classes. End of section.